Great. Well, we will start um, now. So welcome everyone to the second webinar in the harveststrategies.org webinar series, where we will today focus on harvest strategies for tropical tunas, the benefits and challenges. Before I go any further, I do want to mention that there is interpretation for this meeting. So if you see the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom application, you should be able to choose from among English, Spanish, and French. And I'm sure that you will recognize those voices as some of our friendly interpreters from the TUNA RFMO meetings. My name is Grant Galland, and I'm a project director with the Pew Charitable Trusts where I lead our work at the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, or RFMOs. Pew is an international NGO that's headquartered in Philadelphia in the United States, but with other offices around the world, including London, Brussels, Washington, DC, uh, Brisbane, Australia, Santiago, Chile, and others. And we work on a host of different issues, but one of those, a big piece of our work, is on harvest strategies for international wow. fisheries. And that's why- right, Finley, how about it. this? Um, I would something? also just like to mention two other people from the Ocean Foundation, Shana Miller and John Borges. They are essentially the hosts or the moderators of harveststrategies.org. And they are who invited me to uh, participate today. So thank you very much. They're both online and are available in case there are any technical questions about harveststrategies.org or other issues. So first I just ask that everyone make sure that you have your microphones muted and your cameras off so we can share bandwidth. It's a very early morning on Thursday for some of us and a late night on Wednesday for others. Uh, those of us in North America have a very reasonable Wednesday afternoon, so we can't complain. Um, but I do want to just take a couple of minutes to describe why the organizers chose this topic, tropical tunas, uh, the benefits and challenges today. Uh, first of all, as a reminder, tropical tunas are skipjack, yellowfin, and big eye tuna. These are by far the largest tuna fisheries in the world, by far the most valuable tuna fisheries in total wealth. Skipjack, in fact, is, I believe, the third largest wild caught fishery in the world. And yellowfin is also in the top 10, I believe. So these are absolutely massive fisheries um, with extreme importance to coastal communities, extremely important part of the pelagic marine environment and um, are one of the most difficult things, quite frankly, that the tuna RFMOs have to do. Um, that difficulty stems from a variety of reasons, some of which our speakers will touch on today, but perhaps harvest strategies can help. Uh, agreeing on fishing opportunities, whether that's an effort limit or a catch limit or something different, is half of the issue with tropical tuna management. And it's possible that that half can be improved or benefit from harvest strategies. And I hope we'll hear our, from our speakers on those topics today. Also to date, the development of harvest strategies or management procedures has been slower for the tropical tunas than for bluefin, albacore, swordfish, and some others. Um, and there's a question of why, and perhaps we'll hear from our speakers on that topic as well. Now, some things have already happened in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, for example. There's an opportunity this year for West Atlantic skipjack at ICAT. So it's not that there is nothing happening for, for the tropical tuna, it's just the opposite. There's a huge amount happening but it has been slower than some of those other species. And I'm hoping that we're going to learn why. So today we'll hear from five experts who are volunteering their time today to speak with us for about 15 minutes each. Uh, at the end of that time, we'll have plenty of time for question and answers. And when we get to that session, I'll ask you to either raise your hand and I'll try to call on you if you want to ask a question live 
or I'll ask you to put something in the meeting chat, which will be enabled at that time. Uh, I've left the chat disabled just for now because I don't want folks to get distracted uh, in the chat instead of focusing on the speakers. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, and that will be Dr. Miguel Herrera, who is Deputy Director of OPEGAC for Science. OPEGAC is, of course, the largest Spanish persane tuna fishing uh, agency or um, organization, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from Miguel, who will also present on the topic of the day, which is the benefits and challenges of harvest strategies for tropical tunas. Miguel, please. Many thanks, Grant, and um, hello to to everybody. Um, I thanks to the to the organizers to the Common Oceans Project for for inviting uh, me into this um, into this uh, workshop. Um, as as Grant was saying, I am I am working as a as a deputy at uh, OPAGAC, which is a producer organization. Uh, which is representing um, several companies of of poor Saint vessels in uh, that operate in the three in the three oceans. I have been looking at the participants at the at the workshop. Most of them, I think, are English speaking people. So I I will I will make my presentation in in English. I'm going to open it. Give me a sec. Okay, there we go. I hope everybody can see it. We can. Okay, so I go ahead. Um, so regarding the, the, the harvest strategies, um, my, my topic is benefits and, and challenges in, in, in general. Um, and um, regarding the benefits, I think it's, it's quite a straightforward. Um, they will give you some peace of mind. And um, the main questions are, uh, we can think, in the long term, instead of um, being at meetings uh, discussing um, the same topics over and over. So um, there is a question on sustainability of stocks. Um, and um, on on that side, these uh, harvest strategies are going to be accounting for most of the risk um, into this um, into these uh, stock assessments and, and so on. Uh, there is also some peace of mind for scientists uh, and, and managers. Uh, this is saving time um, instead of uh, being running assessments all the time and presenting uh, the results to the um, managers that then need to agree on, on what does uh, this um, advice means. Uh, this is saving uh, in part this decision making process. And I am, I am saying in part, I, I go and, and I'm going to elaborate a bit more on that later. Um, and there is also some sustainability for the for the industry. We can think in the in the long term, and um, that provides some sense of of stability. And again, I put that into brackets because there is some um, situations where this may not be exactly the the case. And I will cover those uh, later as well. And and finally, and and maybe one of the principal questions is that this is uh, facilitating access to, to markets. This is one of the conditions that the Marine Stewardship Council is is um, is putting on, on the certification of the fisheries. And that certification is very important for your um, uh, fish to gain some more uh, value and access to um, uh, to markets. And, and finally, for the industry, the most important thing is, is profit. So um, those would be the main um, benefits uh, which I think everybody is, is aware of, of them in any case. And regarding to the challenges, I am going to cover just four main points that um, um, I have identified. And uh, the first one of them is um, looking at the way this uh, question has been, has been um, uh, developed. Um, we see that we are not sure that all the tuna RFMOs are following the right path. Um, and this is mostly because of the, um, let's say, selection of the management objectives. Um, then the second question would be whether um, the tuna RFMOs are, are there yet in terms of some of the um, biggest concerns that there may be with some of, of the stocks and the uh, assessments that are being carried out. Has allowed me to... 
there is some noise in the background. And um, there is two main questions here. When is, is the state of, of nature? Um, is it right for some of the stocks? And I will we'll put some examples later. And uh, the other one is, is whether uh, the data, uh, RFMO data is good enough to support the process. And I will also put some um, some examples that may have an influence on, on, on the process as well. Um, the third question is, is whether this is really a speed in decision making. Um, and um, I see there is other speakers that are going to be talking about um, allocation. And I think this is an important question to raise as well when we talk about this. Um, we'll come to that again um, in the next slides. And, um, and finally, there is the question of whether we want to do a, a piecemeal a, a approach, let's say, and, and go and adopt harvest strategies for each stock individually, or whether we want to do some multi-species um, harvest strategy process, which uh, seems to be also a, a problematic. Um, and, and in here, I will go a bit into the way in which um, um, the RFMOs are, um, which management measures they are using as, as, the, as the principal uh, measure. Some of them are, are basing uh, management on input measures and some others are, are uh, basing that management on, on output. Um, regarding the first question on, on management of objectives, um, when we look at the at this diagram, for instance, which is from uh, from Pew, thanks for that. Um, and you have a, a link there for uh, if you want to, to see more about this. Uh, the selection of these management objectives is at the top of the um, of of this. Although um, those can be slightly modified as you move on and and revise. Um, over here, they say that they can be revised, for instance, every ten years. Um, but the main question that we find in some of the tuna RFMOs is that this has only been discussed uh, lightly uh, for the stocks. And in some cases, there is some uh, vague text in the convention, which, which is talking about uh, high probabilities and some idea on, on management objectives, but not very specific. And uh, we think that this can be uh, kind of an issue because what the normally uh, the process has been in, in these cases has been that the scientists that are dealing with this in lack of these um, management objectives or very specific management objectives, they are trying different things that they will then present onto the managers for them to, to decide. And uh, we think that this can be confusing in some cases for, for the managers. Um, so ideally, uh, this discussion should have happened in the beginning, and uh, the managers should have had some more clear idea about uh, what the objectives for the fishery they wanted to implement. Um, we think that this question of uh, trial and error may not really help decision making, um, and it's something that maybe needs to be reconsidered. Regarding the second uh, point that I was raising, uh, we see that also some um, RFMOs have, uh, have um, very big problems regarding the, the information that they gather. Uh, I am putting two examples here, uh, which is, for instance, the amount of, uh, let's say, catch data for which uh, there is size data available. And this is an example of the IOTC. And um, you don't remember the, the, I think it's yellow fin tuna, probably. Yeah, yellow fin tuna. Um, so more than half of the catches that the IOTC is, is, um, is getting don't have um, uh, samples. Uh, and, uh, and only that green component over there will have uh, samples that are more or less, or can be more or less uh, reliable. Uh, this may represent a, a big problem in terms of, uh, uh, for instance, identifying what is the selectivity of the fisheries and other things that are uh, very relevant when uh, when you are doing your uh, running your process. And the, the second one is that, all, and this is also an example of the IOTC, but this can be extended to other RFMOs as well, is that uh, we see that there is, in, in some cases, uh, when you start uh, trying your um, management strategy evaluation, you realize that um, the what the let's say what the stock assessment is estimating as uh, the productivity of the of the stock, there is something wrong with that because you run out of um, 
uh, of catch, um, but this is not the situation that you see in the stock. So initially, and uh, the process has been, uh, let's say, um, mm, it cannot, it, it, it has to, um, the, the, the stock assessment has to improve and um, um, for the process to be able to continue because otherwise it's not, it's not going to, um, uh, to be possible to, to finish the management strategy evaluation. Regarding the, another important question that we identify in here is um, that the scientists may have agreed for some stock to uh, the adoption of, of management procedures, but at the same time, those management procedures don't include a key component, which is uh, allocation. Uh, so some resolution is adopted, which ends up in the, uh, for instance, some TAC, um, but there is no allocation key uh, for um, allocating that TAC by uh, flag state or um, by fishery. And uh, this is a very important problem. We have saved time uh, for the scientists and partly for the managers because there is no need to discuss or, or interpretation of science, but then as, as you move to decision making, uh, there is a big fight for um, discussion on allocation. And uh, in some cases, and we see some cases in some RFMOs where the TAC and the allocation don't match, meaning that uh, the catches that are allocated, for instance, uh, are higher than the TAC that is recommended when you run the uh, management strategy evaluation. And this is um, this is a big um, a big problem to our mind, and this is something that that needs to be is solved. Also, um, another problem that um, we consider that is important is the question of of compliance. Um, because we have, in some cases as well, uh, tax and um, allocation uh, procedures that are adopted. But then when we look into the compliance, we see that the tuna FMOs are quite weak in uh, making uh, CPCs comply when there is problems of compliance with the fisheries. In other cases, is uh, that in the conventions you have um, the possibility of, of members objecting uh, to key management measures, and then that is really um, making a very difficult um, compliance with, with tax and other things. An example, again, is, is the IOTC where uh, to a key resolution, for instance, on Yellowfin, um, there is um, some members that were um, objecting that resolution, and those members are um, responsible for, for catches that account for 40% of the total, meaning that that resolution is not very effective in, in reality. Then the question is, if when we have management procedures here, there is going to be uh, any improvement onto this, uh, considering that in some cases, those management procedures just simply um, get an output of, of attack, and then we, we will have the same problem as we have now. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons why we think that probably both things should be uh, connected and the management procedures should contain, to some extent, um, allocation keys as well, so as is, is helping implementation. And, um, and then some better compliance monitoring, and uh, compliance monitoring may be good in some RFMOs, the problem is uh, sanctions and uh, and and those are re to, uh, to not have more really penalize uh, breaches of compliance. Normally, breaches of compliance are are not uh, penalized, and and that means that the resolutions are not very effective. If this happens also with the management procedures, then uh, that that may be a problem. The main problem here is some feeling of discrimination uh, for those that comply. Uh, which may think that, for instance, if you run a, manage, uh, a management uh, procedure and uh, uh, you get attacked and there is a lot of non-compliance, there is no penalties, and then the next year you do the same, uh, and because of that non-compliance, your attack is, gets lower, uh, everybody has to sacrifice for, um, for some that uh, are not complying, and that is a, a real problem, and uh, that is what gives you this uh, feeling of, of discrimination. We think it's very important to 
also some that some improvements happen at the uh, the two RFMOs uh, on on this matter of of compliance. Um, and then one yeah, of the I wanted to tell you about two minutes left. Okay. Okay, I go fast. Uh, one of the the other main questions here is is the question of of multi stock or mono stock, as I was uh, mentioning in the beginning. Um, uh, some of the RFMOs are moving on to um, let's say the single stock harvest strategies, which may be uh, kind of a problem because of of several questions like choke species and other. Um, most of the tropical tuna fisheries are um, multi-species, so it would be um, better that uh, whichever the process is adopted, it is um, multi-stock. All the stocks are included in the same management procedure in, in some manner. And, and we have examples of uh, the Pacific Ocean where there is also a different way or a different approach to the management measures that are important. And um, the Pacific Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, they are using um input while in the uh, other oceans indian and atlantic are using output um, we see that the, these input measures normally work better than the output measures uh, for many reasons and and uh, finally to um uh, to end with this with some uh, final thoughts um one of the questions as well is that we see that in in some uh, tuna fmos uh, when um, there is some discussion about objectives and the, um, some of the um, CPCs that are setting the objectives or discussing allocation are um, trying to bring um, very dramatic changes into the balance of, um, of the fisheries that there is in the ocean. And we think that all this may uh, bring kind of uh, chaos into, into the system. Um, I think we, we need to think that um, in the... The tuna vessels, for instance, um, are a big investment, and uh, you may not want uh, to introduce dramatic changes into the fisheries. Uh, you may rather uh, think of something, um, some stability, and if you want to introduce those changes, some graduality, so as um, uh, you change um, slowly, slowly into any uh, future uh, situation that, that, that you want. Also, um, as I was saying before, there is multi-species and mono-species, but there is also other impacts from the fisheries, which are not normally taken into consideration or not always taken into consideration. And I think those should be incorporated as well. And over there, I am I am uh, mentioning some like um, uh, target species by catch ecosystem and, and socioeconomic. Uh, taking this into consideration as you as you go is is important. The question is whether all whether all these trade-offs can be uh, taken into consideration as as you go, um, and then the chart is showing the uh, the proportion of of the catch um, by the different fisheries in the different RFMOs. And um, this is all. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you very much, Miguel. We really appreciate the. Um strong presentation and um, I've made some notes here of, of things that I've learned, including, um, you know, the fact that many of the challenges you mentioned are almost sort of general challenges of operating at the RFMOs that, uh, that the solutions to those challenges could benefit any management style. So I appreciate that. And I also really appreciate how you touched on several items that will be covered by our following speakers. So you really have set us up nicely here. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll move right to our second speaker. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions for Miguel at the end. Our second speaker will be Dr. Tom Carruthers, who's the CEO of Blue Matter Science, a private company that's um, contributing to the development of management strategy evaluation models all around the world. And he will be touching on one of Miguel's very questions, and that's the development of multi-species MSEs. So take it away, Tom. Right, has my screen come up okay? It has, perfectly, thank you. I'm also, by the way, an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, but uh, try not to hold that against me. <laughs> right, so today, multi-species MSE. Well, if you're thinking about um, pursuing something like this, it's probably a good idea first to understand why you're doing it. And maybe we can decide whether or not that applies to tropicals. 
Uh, on the second point, I'm just going to briefly show you some examples of multi-species MSEs that have been either attempted or conducted elsewhere. I'll talk a little bit about what this means for tropicals. I'll mention a few of the development challenges that are going to be, well, things that certainly have been a challenge in some of my experiences. Um, and then briefly, we'll end on a more positive note and talk about some of the benefits of doing a multi-species MSE. So why do we want to do this? Well, probably the best way of doing this is to show the assumptions that you would need to satisfy to do a single species management strategy evaluation. Here we have two stocks. We want to use a harvest strategy for each. Well, the first thing we need to know, and it needs to be pretty certain, is that there is no important prevailing biological link between these two. So for example, the density of one does not affect the growth of the other. Um, that one of them doesn't actually eat the other or something similar in any appreciable way. So no direct trophic effects, please. Also, we hope they don't compete for spawning habitat and things like that, or affect the behavior of one another. And that has to be true so that when we specify a tack for one, for example, it doesn't imply certain constraints on the tack for the other, that the actual scenarios that we're testing harvest strategies are and can be considered to be distinct. The next thing we, we need is we no biological interactions, but we better then have some ability to independently exploit these two stocks. In this thought experiment, they are disparate spatially. They exist in two different places. So if we had a fishing fleet with a particular um, tack for each stock, that fishing fleet could exhibit dexterity. It could move its distribution to exploit one stock over the other. Um, and therefore, our two different harvest strategies established independently, their advice can be followed, basically. Of course, there's a possibility that these two stocks actually exist in the same spatial, um, same spatial distribution or similar. And even if that were true, there was some spatial overlap we might still be able to use our single species approach if there is sufficient disparity technically. So for example, here we could use depth and set our gear at different depths um, to avoid one stock or, or prosecute another. We could use, it doesn't have to be depth. It could be the gear type. It could be the mesh size. It could be something similar like that. So we could have geographical overlap, but actually be able to use single species harvest strategies and MSE if we can have this technical disparity. And that just enables us to, again, move our fishing around. Pretty obvious, right? Pretty easy. So the conditions for single species MSE and harvest strategies, ignorable biological interactions, and either they're spatially disparate or they're technically disparate or both. Under these circumstances, we might be able to say, okay, the single species approach is good enough. And of course, this logical condition sets up the opposite, the conditions where we want to do multi-species MSE. There are, in this case, non-ignorable biological interactions between these two stocks. Um, and they are overlapping in both space and technical the technical overlap. We can't, we don't have dexterity in fishing. We can't choose one over the other. And if you think about it, that setup that you see there, um, there's some aspects of that that might be very applicable to tropical tuners, particularly the bottom half to do with the overlap spatially and technically. So that in general, multi-species MSE is appropriate when you're establishing harvest strategies for multiple stocks. And you cannot assume that the management of one is independent of the other. Um, they're somehow constrained. So for example, the TAC applied to one species implies constraints on one or more of the other species. Then you have to start considering multi-species MSE. I'm not a total, you know, I don't know, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of multi-species MSE, but I looked around the place and found that basically for the most part, uh, biological interactions have not been the focus of multi-species or multi-stock MSE. 
for the most part, they've actually focused just on the technical interactions. So there's a few examples here of um, MSEs that have either been applied or are in development or have been considered. The first, which is the old, one of the oldest running management strategy evaluations on earth, uh, is that of South African anchovy and sardine. Now, the sardine fishery is the famous fishery. It's the one you see in every single nature movie, one of the world's largest migrations. Um, that's sardine that comes down the Cape. And that is that has a, interact, uh, a technical interaction with the anchovy fishery, principally that juvenile sardines are caught in the anchovy fishery. And so the MSC in this case um, models these two different populations, but the management strategy acknowledges the bycatch of one species and the other. And so, for example, I think I've just ripped this plot from a previous um, paper, but increasing, for example, the catch of anchovy implies a reduction in the catch of sardines, for example. And so this is all about the technical interaction. The harvest strategy that they actually employed is a fixed exploitation rate. Essentially, it catches the same proportion of vulnerable biomass um, over time. So when vulnerable biomass in the survey is high, they catch proportionally more. Uh, it was multi-species, I think, until very recently, but they have um, recently um, de detected declines in the sardine um, stock. And I think now it's just applied to anchovy alone. The second example is one that we're working on, and that is the South Atlantic grouper snapper fishery. Now, this is like one of those woohoo beer and fist pumps, and you know, it's that kind of recreational fishery. It's hook and line, it's uh, a commercial hand line that's about as big as the recreational fishery. But the key issue here is that in any one trip, um, these guys can target as many as 10 different species. Excuse me. <clears throat> And so there's a technical interaction. Um, uh, any constraints on gear or regulations affect all these different creatures simultaneously. Um, and, and certainly setting restraints, constraints on one would affect the others. Now, the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Commission are looking at harvest strategies, yes, but they're also looking at MSE as a kind of calculator a centralized place for testing ideas on regulations and gear and things like that. Uh, this MSE has only just started. Um, we're in our second year of this, but eventually could involve more than 10 species and 50 fleets. Um, so this one's ongoing, but again, it's all about that technical issue of seeing that more than one species is being caught at the same time. The way that this um, is constructed this MSE is to take the individual stock assessments and glue them together um, and then impose scenarios on those. So this is an approach that could be used for tropical tuna, for example, if they've been assessed. Atlantic bluefin tuna is a not multi-species, but it's multi-stock. And really it's another one of these technical interactions. This occurs because the Western stock mixes from the Gulf of Mexico throughout the North Atlantic and it mixes eastward. The Eastern stock originating in the Mediterranean mixes westwards. And because we have TACs in the East and West, we have an interaction, a technical interaction. When we set attack in the West, for example, that includes the Eastern stock in it. Fish from the Eastern stock are caught and vice versa. And so this is another technical interaction. Um, it's a real challenge developing this MSE because you have to gather all the information to characterize this migration and mixing. But again, similarly to the anchovy MP, this is a fixed exploitation rate harvest strategy. Uh, it was adopted last year, provided advice this year, and it catches a fixed fraction of the vulnerable biomass. There's another case where you might look at multi-stock or multi-species MSE, and that is when uh, you have stock complexes. For example, an MSE has been developed for deep and deep water and regular Acadian redfish um, here on the eastern 
uh, seaboard of Canada in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and again, it's a case where they can't tell these two different species apart. So they're using MSE to deal with the stock complex uh, and work out how it how their management affects those two different species or could do. It's similar to bluefin in California. They have the same species, but in a central and southern part of California. They've developed operating models, but I don't know how far they are or how far they've gone with uh, MP adoption. I'm pretty sure in both these cases, MPs have not been adopted. As far as I can tell, there are no MSEs that include biological interactions, but I know of a few that I've developed and looked at. One is here in BC uh, with herring and seals. The biological interaction is pretty obvious. That seal is definitely eating uh, a herring. Um, and so it's a unidirectional um, interaction. There's an interesting one in Newfoundland where we know that cod eat shrimp, but we think that shrimp eat the juvenile stages of cod. So there's a two-way interaction, biological interaction based on predation. There's another um, considered in the same area or thereabouts, Atlantic cod and seals. And again, it's a case of seals eating cod. There is an awful lot of work done in multi-species ecosystem models like Ecopath with Ecosim and Atlantis. But as far as I know, none of those have been used in a formal MSE process. And one thing to note, it's a subtlety here, is that you don't have to do a multi-species MSE if the interaction is unidirectional, like it's like the seal herring example, and you're not managing seals. You can just have future scenarios for seal populations and see how that affects herring in the projections. So you just do a one species MSE with scenarios for the predator, for example. Of course, for tropical tunas, we definitely have a technical interaction. Here we've got the recent catches of the principal species in the Atlantic mapped out, and they are caught in approximately the same areas by three different gear types. So definitely a technical interaction. We also don't think there's lots of scope for allocation and gear control. So we're not going to have that technical disparity. So that would point to a multi-species MSE by necessity. There could be biological interactions, but we don't have a very precise handle on those. And for some of the early life stages, we also have the stock complex problem that we're not quite sure necessarily which species that juvenile fish is from or which species it is. One of the key development problems you're going to have for multi-species MSE is reference points. People like MSY reference points. Well, guess what? They don't exist in reality. Um, and we can just about convince ourselves they exist in a single sp species model. But as soon as you have multiple species, you realize that concepts to do with reference points don't exist, and it becomes problematic. And I recommend anybody read Beth Fulton et al's paper on that, where they make that really clear. Another problem is going to be presentation of results. Here we have a table of performance outcomes across management procedures, where we have management procedures by row and performance by column. And essentially, for just one stock here, we're trying to work out which row is best, essentially. And it's quite difficult across multiple columns. It's quite difficult to see which is best. As soon as you have multiple stocks, that gets even harder. And if you're doing three species of tropical tuners, you've now got an enormous amount of results output to try and navigate to decide what's the best or the most appropriate management procedure. So we have a real issue of results presentation. One way of solving that is to tune the management procedures to a given performance outcome and that would remove a column here. We wouldn't have that performance. We could use satisficing to say they met some minimum requirement, in which case we'd lose a column and we'd lose rows, management procedures that didn't meet that requirement. And we could remove any metrics which were essentially saying the same thing as another metric. They were collinear. If you're going to do multi-species MSE for tropicals, you're going to have to be very um, efficient and clear and use simplification methods to represent the results. It's going to be difficult. About one minute left, Tom. Yeah, no problem. Another thing is that 
it's going to be really difficult or potentially very difficult to design a management procedure that can navigate these complicated um, dynamics. Another issue is we're going to ask managers to weigh, for example, yield of one species against um, conservation performance of another. And that could be quite difficult to do. In terms of benefits, clearly the big thing here is that we can establish a management procedure that can navigate a wide range of uncertainty. It will account for stock scenarios that are mutually exclusive. We may not be able to have high productivity of all the species together. Um, you can argue that MSE is the only way that we have of testing management procedures against um, a wide range of biological hypotheses, which aren't tested yet. Um, so things that we can test in robustness tests, but also we can establish the reliability of indicator systems. So bycatch indicator systems and so on. So we can actually use our simulations to work out how to build indicators of problematic um, scenarios, um, something we're working on in a project called EcoTest. Um, so there's lots of benefits um, of the multi-species approach, um, although there will be technical challenges in building the framework and summarizing results. Uh, thanks, Grant and Shana, for inviting me and um, everybody else who worked on these various projects that I've put results and figures from. Thanks very much. Great. And thank you, Tom. That was very in informative. And I look forward to the question and answer session because I know some folks will probably have some specific tropical tuna questions for you. I, but I do appreciate all of the context and that will set that up very nicely. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll move to our third speaker of the day, and that's Mr. Ludwig Kumoru, who's the Director of Fisheries Management for the Forum Fisheries Agency in the Pacific, and a former negotiator from Papua New Guinea, so a real expert in these issues. And he'll be presenting today on harvest strategies for the world's largest tuna fisheries. Thank you, Ludwig. Thank you and uh, good day, evening, night, wherever you are, everyone. I will, let me see my presentation. You see my presentation? Yes, just um, hit that little slideshow button again and then you'll be in the in the right form. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'll be speaking on the harvest strategies in the Western uh, Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. And as mentioned, it is the biggest tuna fisheries in the world. So I will basically go straight to the background of the Western Central Pacific Tuna Commission, how we make decisions. And hopefully through that, we see the challenges that we face and then touch briefly on what we see as the benefits in harvest strategies and then touch on to what we are doing, what where we are and where we are going forward and some of the bigger challenges that we probably face in future with uh, multi-species fisheries. So basically, the Southwestern Central Pacific uh, Fisheries Commission boundaries and uh, the commission is responsible for the management of tuna fisheries within the convention area. And this area is the area with the highest tuna catch globally. And of course, the on the RFMO with all key commercial tuna species, either neither office nor in an office state. And it's uh, an area with multi-species fisheries as well. Moving on, as I mentioned, that just gives a graphics of what I mentioned. Uh, catch and stock status by tuna thermos so western pacific with the highest catch and stocks all in the healthy state so again the other thing i wanted to emphasize on the slide is that most of the ezs in this commission area uh, most of the area within this commission is all ezs so brings in the complexity in um, decision making so Seen there, it's a uh, most most area is under easy of small island developing states. And most of the fisheries that occurs within this commission is in the easy of small island uh, developing states. 
Commission has 25 members, but also we have cooperating non-members, participating territories, NGOs, and industry players. One way or another influence decision making in the in the commission. And decision is by consensus. Anyone or any two members can block up decisions. And there's it's very complex negotiation that takes place within this commission. And of course, with that comes huge challenges in decision making. Within this uh, group, within this commission, we have all the Pacific Islands come under this organization that I work for called the Pacific Island, Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency. And through this organization, we, we, we provide support to help the members you know, understand the issues in the commission, of course, covering issues currently like in harvest strategies to help them with their decision making. So in this, in the context of harvest strategies, this organization that I work for, we provide support through capacity building with our sister organization, Pacific, uh, which is the uh, secretary of the Pacific community or the Pacific community as it is called now. So we try to help our members, we support our members through capacity building and advice. So members can understand, you know, concepts in harvest strategies, approach to manage their tuna fisheries. Note that most of these countries are very small and they their economies are actually, in most cases, entirely based on tuna fisheries and providing up to more than 50% more than of their country's revenue comes from fisheries. So every, every decision, these countries are very, they have to really understand these things before they move on. So when, when we help these countries, so we provide other countries, this includes facilitating internal negotiation. We have to negotiate among ourselves, among ourselves to so that every member country's issues are understood before we can move on as a group, as the FFA group, and then we start negotiating again with our distant water fishing nations. So through these negotiations, we try to accommodate the interest that um, try to accommodate the interest of the members. And in the context of our harvest strategies, this interest or the objectives that the members put forward helps to inform the target reference points for tuna stocks, which we which are crucial for the development of the commission's harvest strategies. So this issue on harvest strategies, it's still very much new in the commission. We haven't fully understood how it works. We are all learning. Yes. Let's have you have a point out there. The concept power storage is relatively new to most members, especially those in whose EEZ most fishing is carried out. And in the past, when these harvest strategies were mentioned, there was uh, reluctance by the members to accept this um, harvest strategy approach. It's basically because Members found it very difficult to move forward without fully understanding the implications of this strategy. As I mentioned, most of their revenue is dependent on fisheries. They have got to know what they are going to lose or what they are going to gain before they can move on. So these sort of things takes time. So, but eventually, a couple of years ago, as I have on, on my right side of the screen, the commission, the members have basically agreed. They have agreed that all, all key tuna fisheries in the Western Central Pacific Tuna Commission area will be managed under harvest strategies, under the harvest strategy approach. So in a way, there's no turning back. Better understanding, still more to understand. The members have now decided to move forward. They have agreed. So the next thing is, what are we going to do? So. The first of the tuna stocks that is kind of under this uh, new approach now is the skipjack. So skipjack is the first of the four tuna stocks in the Western Central Pacific Ocean for which the management procedures was adopted under the Commission's Harvest Strategy approach. So the main 
um, tuna species that are harvested within this area are skipjack, the big guy, yellowfin, and albacore. So skipjack is the first one now that we are working on. And the skipjack target reference point was agreed to in 2022. And the management procedure for skipjack was adopted in 2022. And the management procedure ran for the first time this year. And the management processor output will be implemented from 2024, subject to this year's commission meeting. So at the end of this year, in December, the commission will make a decision on how we're going to run this. Now, what do we see as a value? value what, what, what is the value of harvest strategies in the Western Pacific? I think, as I mentioned, it's very complex in the Western Pacific. We negotiate with just that. We, we waste a lot of time. And uh, yes, so a lot of things don't move quickly because by nature, it, it's not in a bad way, but because the members have to really understand what they're going to be gaining or losing or are their rights protected, all these sort of things come in and play. But now we see that harvest strategy is probably one way that that provides a more certain uh, operating environment and where management decisions related to the stocks are consistent, consistent, predictable, and transparent. So it cuts off the time. We can make decisions quickly because we have already decided how we are going to do things. We have predetermined rules, so that kind of, that is kind of a benefit to the members. But as I said, we've got to understand every step of the way, what does it mean? And of, of course, it also avoids all this protracted negotiation between members, and which often um, result in no consensus. No consensus, we kick the decision down the street, you know, for another two or three years, and again, waste of time. So hopefully with this, we can cut those time and we can make decisions faster. And the other thing is that the members begin to see that if we go the harvest strategy approach way, there, there are positive outcomes of this strategy, you know, market access, eco labeling, yeah, apart from resource sustainability. And with that in mind, members are more willing to accept this approach. So what are the next steps? We've already got skipjack, working on skipjack. So the next next fishery that is most likely to come under harvest strategy is the South Pacific albacore, which discuss, discussions are now underway on the South Pacific, South Pacific albacore interim target reference point. And hopefully a revised South Pacific albacore inter, interim target reference point will be adopted at this year's commission. So currently, in fact, next week, next week the members uh, will be here meeting and we'll be discussing this I guess the first point is one of the subjects, one of the agendas. And hopefully we can go with an agreement to the commission and have it uh, agreed at the commission, have a target reference point agreed at the commission. The next biggest challenge that we are, will be facing after this is going to be um, the harvest strategies for yellowfin and big guy tunas. It's all come under uh, mixed fishery. So that's, I think, where most of the challenge is going to be. It's all for tuna stocks, all caught by mix of gears, pollen line, pesane, long line, et cetera. And then how do we ensure that the management procedures work across all stocks? So those are the questions that we are facing. And then also the decisions affecting one stock, we know will impact the others. There are countries who put emphasis on on one species more than the other. For example, in this part of the world, most of the countries in the south, on, in the southern Pacific, you know, their main target species is albacore. Those in the central um, equatorial area, is mainly um, skipjack. So all these sort of um, issues. And then, Proposed approach to how to tackle this mixed fishery thing is, is actually currently under evaluation. We have SPC, 
is our scientific provider, science provider who helps us with, with all of this, trying to unpack and understand all these issues and see how we will move forward. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ludwig. And um, you, you finished a couple of minutes early. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just ask one immediate follow-up question. You said several times that it's very important for the members to understand the process. And once they understand each step, they feel more comfortable um, with adopting a new policy like this. Have you seen a, a greater understanding now amongst uh, your members or the, the broader WCPFC? And and do you think that that understanding may shorten the timeline so that Albacore or Big Eye is a shorter timeline than Skipcheck was? Certainly, yes. I think it was a very good experience from the Skipjack. From the Skipjack, so, so what I hear from the members and what they are pushing is that, you know, we, they all all geared towards trying to get this uh, Albacore Interim target reference point up, uh, agreed to at the commission this year. Because they have learned from Skipjack, they say, look, with the management procedures, we just have to look at what was done for Skipjack. Yeah, we don't have to try to really think of something new. let just learn from what we, we, have, we, have, have, we have for Skipjack and, and see how we can, you know, tweak it a bit and apply it to the Albaco fisheries. So with that sort of comment, it's going to cut down the timing. It took us a lot of time to try to get those uh, uh, ideas for skipjack across the, I mean, agreed to at the commission level. And basically because the members ourselves, the small island developing states, were the ones who were reluctant. We, we were not understanding this concept even today. Even at the top management and fisheries, top management levels, we are still struggling. We, we're still trying to learn. Yeah. But once we land it, once we agree, that is no problem. That that's that's actually how you see decisions are made within with within this commission, especially with a with a small island development stage. Once we understand and we all agree, then then we just move. Thank you. That's that's great. Thank you very much. And I hope that there will be some more questions from the audience for you um, at the end of our, our session. So thank you very much, Ludwig. And now we're going to move to our fourth speaker of the session. That's Dr. Adrian Gutteridge, who's a senior fisheries standard manager with the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, he knows that standard inside and out, of course. And um, he'll be presenting on how the new standard impacts tropical tuna harvest strategies. Take it away, Adrian. Thank you. No worries. <clears throat> Just let me know when you can see my screen. We've got it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. My name, as Grant said, is Adrian Gutteridge. I work for the MSC. Um, yeah, so my presentation here is pretty much about, you know, the MSC's new requirements and how they impact tropical tuna harvest strategies. Um, it's just gone 6 a.m. here as well, and I can hear my children running around upstairs. So if you hear some child noise, that's what's happening in my house currently. Um, yeah, so my presentation is pretty much twofold. I'll just give a brief overview of the MSC um, sort of um, uh, scoring sort of and the way that the principles work. And then also the fishery standard review. Uh, that was a process we ran in the last five years that updated our requirements and part of that update was to do with the new harvest strategy requirements and as they apply to RFMO managed fisheries. And so that's very applicable here now to um, obviously this topic to do with tropical tuners. So this next slide and this slide and the next one, sorry, are hopefully familiar to some of you on the call, but um, it's just kind of worth recapping because some of the things I'll be talking about, particularly with the new requirements relate to some of the foundations of MSC assessments. So when a fishery voluntarily enters the MSC program, they're put up against three principles in terms of their uh, fishery performance. Principle one looks at the target stock. So that's the um, stock that will potentially carry the eco label if it's certified. Principle two looks at the ecosystem um, wide impact. So things like bycatch and principle three looks at your management. Uh, when it comes to um, harvest strategies and harvest control rules. 
they're very much focused in principle one because principle one is um, yeah about that target stock. So all the removals and the entire distribution of that stock. Within each of those principles, we have a number of what we call performance indicators, but the key thing is each performance indicator has a level of performance as an increasing uh, sort of metric. So at the 60 level, um, there's a, um, it's the minimum acceptable score and then it moves up to best practice at 80 and state of the art at 100. The numbers are relatively arbitrary, but it's important to kind of, yeah, that concept of minimum acceptable, best practice, state of the art. So when you're scored, uh, the fishery has to meet um, the minimum acceptable across the board for any level of performance. And if it does, it then has a condition in place for that aspect of its fishery. And that condition moves that fishery from minimum acceptable to best practice within uh, one certification period. Also worth noting that even though some aspects of fishery can score minimum acceptable, across all those three principles, which I showed on the previous slide, your fishery has to score uh, best practice as an aggregate. But the take home from this slide really is that the, the, the kind of improvement pathway you have if in MSC certification is scoring minimum acceptable and moving you up to best practice for aspects of your fishery. State of the art is sort of nice to have, but there's no, um, I guess, improvement beyond best practice in terms of what the requirements drive you to do. And that's important to kind of keep in the back of your mind because later on in this presentation uh, with the harvest strategy uh, requirements that has changed somewhat. So a little bit of foreshadowing there. So the fishery standard review, this slide obviously has lots of numbers on it um, and you don't have to remember them if you don't want to, um, but feel free to memorize them. Uh, the, the fishery standard review is something that the MSC does every five years. Our fishery standard um, adheres to um, ISO and FAO um, guidelines and that requires us to update the requirements every five years but I, I guess more than that or uh, as well as that and one of the key the key things it does is sort of a moment in time for the MSC to look at its requirements and see where aspects of it might not be working so well or where aspects could be um, changed based off changes in management globally but the fishery standard review really is something that we um, you know drive as a stakeholder driven process. We, we encourage as much participation as possible. You know, 600 consultation response surveys that all the project leads have to read, um, often till our, till our eyes water. Um, you know, it, it really is a stakeholder driven process. We're open about trying to get as much information as possible. And we really want to try and put our requirements in the best spot when it comes to um, changes or, um, you know, aspects of the, um, the fisheries requirements that might not be, you know, working as well as we were hoping. So there were 16 topics in total that we had in the fishery standard review. And there were sort of five that we called evolution projects. These were ones that sort of led to uh, fairly big changes in our requirements. Um, obviously with the uh, topic today and the group that we're talking to, that I'm talking to now, I'm going to drill down into the harvest strategies for RFMO managed stocks, that project that we ran and that led to new requirements. But for these other four, um, you know, feel free to send me an email or ask me questions about them later on and I'll be happy to answer any questions. But yeah, now drilling down into harvest strategies for RFMO managed stocks. So the question then is, so why did we focus on RFMO managed stocks in the fishery standard review? It was pretty much twofold. So the first was that we had uh, a, a trend where um, stocks and, you know, tropical tuna um, in particular, uh, they'd come into assessment and they'd score at the minimum acceptable level, that 60 level for harvest strategies and harvest control rules. And conditions, um, as I said, drive that aspect of your fishery to best practice within one certification. And that really wasn't happening. We were seeing that, the, the time it was taking at the RFMO level to get those changes because principle one is about, um, you know, the management of those stocks. It was out of sync with what the requirements, um, you know, our MSC requirements were in terms of that condition improvement. So they perhaps our, well, our requirements were probably not reflecting the complexity and um, the way that RFMO managed stocks, um, you know, operate. The second was that 
when fisheries or um, you know, assessments did get to that 80 level for performance for harvest strategies or harvest control rules, they weren't staying there um, in many cases. So our best practice um, you know, uh, requirements for holding fisheries at, at that level might not have been appropriate for RFMOs either. So we sort of looked at that and said, well, maybe we should, you know, come up with a new system or, you know, drill down into what we actually need to do when it comes to RFMO managed stocks. So how did we gather information and who did we gather this information from? The FSR obviously was our information gathering uh, exercise, went out to public consultations. Lots of the people on this call were part of that. Uh, so thanks very much for your time and your input. And then who do we gather from? As I said, people on this call, but we also uh, developed we we'll started to look at MSE, Management Strategy Evaluation, as uh, a way that RFMA managed stocks would need to, um, need to uh, MSE as a pathway they'd need to do in order to meet our requirements. So we ran a targeted consultation for MSE experts in um, like basically global fisheries that included all the tuna RFMOs. And we really wanted to gather uh, information about like the key things to running an MSE objectives, milestones, all that kind of thing. And from that, we tried to codify that as best we could uh, in terms of putting them in the requirements. And so that leads us to the question of what are the new requirements? The first thing here to talk about is, I mentioned that, you know, I keep talking about the minimum acceptable best practice state of the art. We have this term in the state of the art level of harvest strategy performance called designed. This wasn't previously um, defined in our requirements, but now we define a state of the art designed harvest strategy as one that includes a managed procedure and that has been developed through management strategy evaluation. So if you're a fishery that wants to meet SG100, that is what you have to demonstrate that your fishery has. And when it comes to RFM managed stocks, that is now um, a compulsory aspect of your fishery. So this is a schematic that shows what our new RFMO managed stock requirements are. On the right, at the very end of that arrow, you can see the outcome is a designed harvest strategy, one that is tested through MSE. To get you there, we've come up with seven um, milestones that were developed through that targeted consultation, as well as you know, literature to do with um, MSE development. And we've essentially broken these into two phases. The first phase sort of focuses on the science aspect. So you, you know, come up with your management objectives, develop your operating models, and then demonstrate that there's a stakeholder um, feedback as those are being developed. And then at the end of that phase, you have your kind of um, preferred harvest strategy or harvest strategies identified. You then move into phase two. So phase two is sort of more policy focused in terms of agreeing um, you know, an effort or catch mechanism for that harvest strategy. And then it's about implementing that in your fishery um, more broadly, so that entire stock. And then the effectiveness review in place as well, so that you can um, identify issues as they come up. So in terms of the timing that we're giving fisheries to do, obviously this level of performance, SG100, this is the only part of our requirements where we are both pushing fisheries to a state of the art level when it comes to their harvest strategy, and we're prescriptive in the milestones that need to be met in order for you to get there. So in terms of the timelines we're giving fisheries, so this applies to the stock. So for any stock that hasn't been MSC certified before, we're giving them 10 years to complete these seven milestones. So essentially um, at, at a maximum. So at essentially phase one could be one certification period, and then phase two could be the second certification period noting that certifications are typically five years. For stocks that have been certified previously, um, all seven milestones need to be completed in five years. So rather than have that broken across two certifications, any previous stock has to have um, that sorted within five years of applying these new requirements. In terms of just some take-homes from that as well, you know, this applies to each stock. So as it comes into assessment, that stock, because it's principle one, applies these requirements to demonstrate they can get themselves to SG100 within whatever timeline um, matches their uh, historical MSE certification. 
and any subsequent assessments have to have the same milestone and deadline. So there's no kind of skipping um, of milestones as you come into the program. The RFMOs that apply this are on the screen there. These come from the FAO list. This is something that we didn't reinvent. And on that point, hopefully those milestones I've put up before, you know, we did our best to, you know, um, make them applicable as to how they get, uh, how MSE applies in uh, management globally. And the RFMO list was something we didn't come up with ourselves. So we really haven't tried to reinvent the wheel here. We've tried to be as, um, you know, comparative as possible. In terms of timelines um, for when these requirements will be applied. So any new assessment that comes in, the requirements for the new version of the requirements, version 3.0, they're effective now. So any new assessment has to apply uh, these requirements pretty much now. For previously certified stocks, uh, there's sort of two things here. The first to note is that the Western Central Pacific um, tuna stocks are going using this as an early application process. So they're doing this right now and that process will hopefully wrap up early next year. And then for all others, uh, they will apply um, as a mandatory aspect at their first reassessment after November 25. Um, part of the FAO's sort of requirements that we adhere to is that you need three years grace period for previously certified fisheries to apply new requirements. So that's why it's November 25, because they were our new requirements were released in November 22. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for your time. And I'll hand back to you, Grant. Great. Thank you, Adrian. That was super informative. And um... I know I definitely learned a lot about the the thinking behind the new uh, the new standard. So thank you very much. Um, since you did end a couple minutes early, I will just go ahead and ask an immediate follow up question as well. And that's what sort of industry perspective you've been getting on um, this part of the standard. And are you seeing some of your already certified fisheries um, buy into the the standard three here, or um, has it been slow? I mean, what's the sort of feedback from industry? Yeah, well, the, as I mentioned, the Western Central Pacific fisheries are all going through um, the early application of these requirements. So they've, um, yeah, they, they're going through that process right now. So the buy-in there is unanimous in the Western Central Pacific. Um, when it comes to reassessments outside um, the Western Central Pacific for other stocks, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's similar to what we had when we changed, when we updated our requirements last time. That three-year um, window for uptake of version three um, is optional for fisheries. So if they want to do it, they can. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's relatively um, accepted that this is, this is the pathway that needs to be followed. And I'd say for tropical tunas in particular, like, you know, the MSE pathway is something that's familiar to a lot of people. And you know, as we've seen from the present, those fisheries are headed anyway. So it's, you know, nothing new that's come about. It's just now, you know, part of the requirements that we're saying that has to happen, not only for tuna, but all RFMOs um, around the world. Great. Well, thank you again. And as, as someone who works on RFMOs all the time, I, I actually appreciate that you're looking at RFMO fisheries separately from non-RFMO fisheries. I think that seems like a very reasonable pathway forward. So Thank you for your presentation and we'll um, get back to you with some questions at the end. Thanks very um, much. Finally, I would just like to move to our last speaker of the day and then it looks like we'll have uh, about 25 minutes for questions after that. Um, um, next will be Dr. Hussein Sinan, who's the Oceans Nexus Postdoctoral Fellow at Dalhousie University and a, uh, still to this day, I think, a negotiator for the Maldives at, at the IOTC and some other places. So. Um, he will be presenting today on harvest strategies and allocation, which is something he's a, a real expert in and is currently even uh, working on editing a book on, on allocation. So um, Sinan, please take it away. Uh, oh, sorry, I just... I don't know what happened, but let me. No we we could screen. see your screen, no problem, but I think you stopped sharing. Okay, here you go. Um, thank you. So, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shana, and, and, and thank you, Grant, for inviting me uh, to speak on, on, on our strategies and allocation. 
Um, my presentation today uh, will focus mainly on, on the linkage between harvest control uh, or harvest strategies and, and allocation and, and, and the importance of uh, working together on these both important uh, aspects. And as Miguel mentioned, there are certain, there are types of output control methodologies that, that we could also apply in, in the management of um, RFMO fisheries. Um, it is important that we do not stop at, at adopting harvest control or harvest strategies and, and, and stop, but also focus on, on, on the second phase as uh, present by Adrian as well on, on, on the management aspect of uh, the fishery itself. Um, so when we talk about fisheries management, it is really important that uh, we talk, uh, we, we think about investing, not only about understanding the science behind or uh, science on, on fish, and, and, and the management of fish, but we also need to think about how we do we alter the behavior of uh, people um, when we talk about, and then, and then manage the fishery itself. Uh, and it's really important that we focus on, on, on how we would mitigate the impacts on, on, on uh, the fishermen and the community and, and the value chain around it when we uh, manage the fishery itself. So, um, I, I think Ludwig also highlighted a little bit on on the uh, on this relationship on understanding how countries uh, behave in RFMO uh, negotiations or RFMO management decision framework. Uh, for example, in here, if you could look at um, so Bailey in her paper explained a little bit more on on explaining it as using a, a double principle agent problem. Uh, where, for example, uh, Indonesia uh, in an RFMO, when, before they go into an RFMO decision framework, they would need to find out the different fishing interests, uh, for example, on different fishing gears, different fishers, uh, communities, traders, uh, value chain, uh, 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 people involved in the value chain, including port workers, and then try to balance those uh, in an RFMO setting with other member other members in the organization. For example, if you look at in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, for example, Indonesia has to balance these interests with Kenya, Seychelles, uh, who, who might have different uh, fisheries objectives or different management objectives when uh, when we go into fishery. So it, 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 it's trying to, trying to find a balance on, on different management objectives, but also trying to find uh, on, on the balance on how do they achieve uh, best uh, on uh, for their fisheries, um, uh, fisherman community itself. While they balance these, there are also public and private interventions or influences on how they balance these interests when, when, when they go into uh, a decision framework. So as, as Ludwig mentioned, it's not an easy process and, and it takes time to balance these interests and to uh, ensure that all other members on the organization understand these nuances before a decision framework is, is agreed to. And, and, and this complexity is, is not all on, on, on just allocation or it's, it's very common in all conservation and management measures. In particular, this is uh, crucial in, in allocation or catch limit negotiations. For example, in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, uh, it has taken almost 13 years uh, for us to uh, negotiate uh, on, on, a, on an allocation framework, and still there is no uh, light at the end of the tunnel at the moment uh, with regards to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Even though the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission has tried to uh, develop an allocation framework uh, based on a formula-based methodology, uh, uh, which is quite unique compared to all the other RFMOs, uh, it, it still takes time to understand those, those uh, nuances as well. And then obviously uh, the 2020, 2021 uh, COVID didn't help that negotiation itself. Um, while IOTC uh, has this process of uh, allocating on, on a formula-based method, uh, there is still a, uh, an interim plan for yellowfin, which uh, Miguel highlighted is 40% of those uh, catches have been uh, above uh, the limit as well. Uh, there are countries that fish, um, that have objected to the measure. 
Uh, there is also a big eye uh, management plan uh, as well it agreed by the commission which uh, luckily uh, members have have it all agreed to and and hopefully it would adhere to to the limits agreed on on, on that um it's very similar in in other rfmos um seto did an uh, analysis on understanding uh, the allocation um, on on three main frameworks looking into equity legitimacy and, and citizenship and, and found out that WCPFC performed much better than all the other uh, organizations, uh, including uh, CCSPD, IATTC, and, and ICAT. Um, in particular, they, uh, it, it is really important when we talk about allocation, uh, the principle of equity and, and, and legitimacy is, is protected because without these three main elements, uh, the allocation regime might not be stable enough to for a long-term plan. Uh, in, in particular, when we talk about uh, harvest strategies, which which we plan for a certain period of time, um, so ensuring that these main principles are protected are quite essential. However, when we look at, for example, in CCSPT, uh, the management framework has improved uh, in, in the last few years, even though it has not been stable. Member countries have. Uh, adhered uh, to the management framework, understanding the the desire, uh, the the uh, status of the stock at, at this point of time, and 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 also I would like to note that uh, the the allocation system has has not been as uh, stable as as uh, noted in the last performance review. So if you look at the case of CCSPD, for example, uh, until the late 90s or late, late 90s and early 2000s, there has not been uh, a TSC that has been agreed uh, by, the, uh, by, the, by the commission. And, and in the performance review of 2008, uh, it raised the concerns of the legitimacy and, 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 and the plausibility of CCSPD, whether a management framework could be agreed to. Uh, or, or, or the, whether there are uh, legitimate interests of, of countries for uh, agreeing a TAC for uh, for or the management of CC, of Southern Bluefin tuna. Uh, however, the Commission uh, managed to uh, get their eggs together, and 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 the uh, and since then has agreed uh, on on a management procedure. Uh, for example, in 2011, uh, the CCSPD adopted uh, the Bali procedure with an interim rebuilding plan of uh, to rebuild the stock 20% of the original spawning biomass. And since then, uh, it has consistent, consistently improved uh, at around about 5% per year and is on the verge of meeting that objective. Um, in 2022, uh, three years ago, the uh, uh, Commission also agreed a Cape Town procedure uh, which uh, improved uh, the probability uh, or the spawning target uh, by 2035, and hopefully uh, that 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 target would also uh, be achieved. Uh, and you could look at uh, the stock status, and, and and the stock status has improved uh, compared to the uh, the first performance review uh, for uh, CCSPD. But much of these successes has been down to four, four main elements. And first is a clear focus and a clear management objective from the nine member countries of CCSPD. Um, and, and, and also the investment on, on scientific projects and, and, and to develop and improve methodology on, 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 on these aspects. Uh, with regard, and, and also a clear, transparent uh, review process that, that could uh, be supported by, by member countries. So understanding the science is also quite important. And, and one of the aspects um, that, that uh, to build trust in, in harvest control rules and harvest strategies is uh, for member countries to trust the process that's been done uh, by scientists as, 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 as these uh, mathematical models are quite complex indeed. Um, thirdly, I think uh, it's really important that um, even though the uh, allocation um, system in CCSPD is not stable at, at the moment, uh, the consensus agreement, um, even though the negotiations go late at night uh, on the last day of the meeting, um, the members have, have managed to adhere to the allocation system until uh, now, even though there are in, in cases of overcatch, which has been taken into account in, in the management procedure itself. 
Um, and, and finally, I think uh, the last part is about the monitoring control and surveillance measures that have been adopted by CCSPD in supporting uh, the two, uh, two, two uh, el other elements on, on science and the implementation of the location regime itself. Um, however, the case of IOTC, uh, for example, on Skipjack is totally a different matter. Uh, so the IOTC adopted a harvest control rule in 2016 um, that uh, the stock was in a healthy state and, and remains to be on a healthy state at, at this point of time. However, uh, the stock has been uh, overfished or overfished uh, above the harvest control uh, limit uh, since 2018. Um, the control, the catch limit uh, from, for example, in 2018 was 470,000 tons but it exceeded by 30% in 2018 and continues to, um, to be fished above uh, the harvest control uh, limited agreed by uh, the uh, scientific committee and, and by the commission itself. And, and one of the uh, um, mentioned, and this shows that there is a, a sense of uh, hope or sense of a fake sense of hope uh, for some member countries that uh, by agreeing to harvest control rule or a harvest strategy while the stock is uh, of, or in a healthy state gives that false hope of, of maintaining the stock in, 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 in a healthy state. Um, even though after the uh, harvest control limit has been agreed in 2016, the commission uh, has adopted limits for yellowfin and, and big eye, uh, while there have been uh, certain instances where negotiations on, on skipjack has occurred in the past, there is no urgency shown by member states on adopting a uh, harvest control uh, or uh, adopting an agreed TAC on allocation system, mainly because there are there is uh, also uh, other uh, difficulties within the commission in the in agreement on, on getting uh, an allocation system in place. So these two systems in IOTC runs simultaneously while uh, developing an allocation um, system in place and then also developing uh, a separate mechanism to manage the uh, the fisheries itself by developing uh, limits for for certain species individual species so looking learning from these two experiences I think it's really important that uh, uh, the the three elements are in, in management uh, in particular whether it's an allocation or an effort control uh, harvest strategies once it, uh, it it identifies a total allowable catch, uh, the implementation process has to be quite smooth with, and, and allow that mechanism to be equitable uh, to may, make sure to ensure that uh, the uh, the process remain stable in 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 the long run and also been has been supported through the compliance and, and, and monitoring control and and surveillance mechanisms to ensure that uh, the member countries remain within their location limits so that uh, the stock status uh, continues to improve in, in the long run. So in conclusion, uh, harvest control uh, strategies or harvest strategies and allocation are, are important elements uh, for fisheries management. Um, adoption of harvest strategies incentivize uh, to improve the management condition uh, in particular, when, uh, when when the stock is overfished, and as, as seen in the case of CCSPT. Um, and and it's, um, in the case of CCSPD as well, it, it has to be noted that uh, in, in last performance review, it noted the uh, difficulties of, um, of member countries, even though it is nine member countries, uh, the difficulty in understanding the science that goes into uh, the uh, harvest uh, strategies and, and to the need to build in capacity in member countries to understand and the link in to improve the linkages between uh, science and, and fisheries. Uh, and and this, this, is, this has been one of the key uh, messages in, in most RFMOs with regards to harvest strategies. Um, and also um, uh, there is at the moment uh, a lack of attention uh, to allocation mechanisms and, and the need to maintain its stability uh, while we just focus at the moment on, on certain elements in, in the management framework. And we need to pay equal attention to the three elements that, as I mentioned, uh, allocation, uh, compliance, and, and, and also on, on harvest strategies. Thank uh -huh. you. 
And thank you very much, Sanan. We really appreciate that. And I, I especially appreciate you joining from the Seychelles in the middle of the night after being in um, uh, RFMO meeting for the entire day. So uh, you might win the award for the, the toughest presentation hour, but we did have folks at uh, late nights and early mornings all around the world. So, so thank you to everyone. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite all of the uh, presenters or panelists to turn your cameras on and sort of join me for a virtual panel discussion here. Um, to the audience, I'd like to invite you to raise your hand if you have a question for one of our speakers and, um, and you'll be um, offered the chance to unmute. Um, also, the chat will now be open. So if you'd prefer to chat your question, that would be fine as well. And we will um, get to them uh, while we can. And just while you're getting your questions into the chat, I, um, I do have a question um, going back to Miguel. It seems like a while ago that uh, you were presenting Miguel, but um, I was really uh, struck by the number of times you mentioned the need to have clear management objectives before you get too deep into the process, especially for um, a multi-stock MSE like, like might be necessary for tropical tuna. So I'm wondering if you want to just comment for another minute about that and um, what, what might be your objectives um, coming from industry for, for some of these, um, these models. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Granly, for for the question. I maybe I, I'm not going to the objectives of the of the industry directly, but um, uh, the question there to me, for instance, um, if you if you use the case of of ICAT, um, there is no there is not an idea now on how the fishery has to be managed um, in terms of output input. And there is opinions on whether or or checks on whether, uh, for instance, um, a management system which is similar to the one that is used in the Western and Central Pacific, or the IATTC may work better for tropical tuna stocks, um, may be may assist better the process than uh, management uh, through um, uh, tax and, and and allocation. And I think that that is a fundamental question, probably that may um, may be very influential for how you do things uh, later and how you set up your MSC and, and and the like. So to me, that's one of the main questions that maybe some of the RFMOs are still hesitating uh, and uh, discussing that uh, um, is probably delaying a bit um, the process. Or in the case of ICAT, for instance, there is some trials of both and uh, and um, and they they are trying to to look into MSC, uh, looking at uh, output input in the end, uh, to see how that uh, can work, and um, and that's one of the of the things. Uh, the other question that is important to me is, and I think that was mentioned also by uh, by Sinan, is the question of compliance and, and allocation, and in particular allocation, because if you uh, if you um, agree on an allocation regime that is changing quite dramatically, or maybe changing quite dramatically, uh, how your fisheries operate, or the or the balance of the fisheries that you have in the ocean at, at some point in time, uh, that may be also very influential on and has an impact. So your management objectives have to be aligned to some extent with uh, the allocation the regime that you uh, want to see in in the future, I guess. And that those those are questions that the RFMOs are still, or some of them uh, have, are not clear about. And I think this this is something that needs to progress uh, along with uh, with the process of of MSC and and uh, harvest strategies. That's a very good point. Thank you. And it is true that the RFMOs, in my experience as well, it can be difficult for them to move away from business as usual. So if there's something they've been doing for a long time, it can be difficult to look at what the other uh, groups or oceans have, have been doing. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, I'd like to go to Doug Butterworth now, who's in the audience, um, who has a question. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, a question for Adrian Gutteridge. Um, I'm very pleased to see where MSC is going in pushing uh, MP adoption in the uh, tuna RFMOs. But, and there had to be a but here, 
The question is, aren't you trying to move too fast? Uh, the reality is there is not the expertise available, scientific expertise available in individual RFMOs to handle as many MP developments as you're asking for to be done simultaneously. Uh, and a an MP which is poorly uh, put together is likely to cause more problems than not having one at all because uh, we're going well at the moment because fortunately, and I'd be interested if there are any counter examples, all the MPs in place have, when implied, uh, implemented, said, put the TAC up. We've still got to come to the real test, which is when they say, pull the TAC down, will they be implemented? And the line I take is from IWC, which has got over 30 years of experience, far more than others. They have a very strong rule. That is, even though they've got a lot of... Uh, a lot of expertise available, they do not consider uh, working on more than two uh, MPs or MSEs at the same time. And what is happening at the moment is a number of RFMOs are trying to do much more than that. My question to Adrian is, shouldn't you slow it down? Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. Yeah, I guess um, the the way that we've like develop those timelines for implementing um, the MPs through management strategy evaluation that came through the fishery standard review. We, you know, were very open about the public consultation that was involved in terms of asking specific questions about our proposed requirements and putting those timelines out there as to what was realistic. Um, we got quite a bit of feedback about that. And it was very divided in terms of, uh, I'd say equally divided in terms of um, we shouldn't allow more time for fisheries to do this because particularly for tropical tuners, they should have been working on this um, as it was. So they should just be able to do that as soon as they're certified. We shouldn't give them more time um, through to, you know, five to 10 years possibly isn't enough for this to happen. So I guess we've sort of landed in a place where we think there's a middle ground for it, both in terms of stocks that haven't been certified having 10 years and previously certified stocks having five years in addition to do this. Um, so the answer is, I, I think it's, it, 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 our feedback was it depends who you ask relative to appropriate timelines. The one thing I'll say as well is, um, you talked about, you know, an MP that's not as high performing or not as well set up um, compared to others. We've, because we've got prescriptive milestones, um, which is the only place we have these in the requirements and we have guidance around that. So things like your assessment model needs to be, um, you know, known in advance, your data needs, all those kind of things. And you have to show that you're involving stakeholders in that process. If it can be done in that time, we're hoping that there's a consistency of what is then um, implemented in that fishery. Um, but yeah, I certainly take your point that the, the, the pathway that we've developed is not without its challenges and is for sure a, um, a step up comparatively to other parts of our requirements and what existed previously. Great. Thank you, Adrian. And, you know, in the spirit of uh, it depends on who you ask, a, an organization like mine might say that it hasn't been fast enough. So I, I certainly um, take Doug's point, but, uh, but appreciate your, your answer, Adrian. Um, I do see a question in the chat, which I'll get to in just a moment, but I had a question um, for Tom. Um, first of all, you're making me thirsty talking about all that grouper and snapper fishing, but um I, I do, you know, based on the, the different challenges you mentioned, I did want to ask just very directly, is multi-stock MSE possible for tropical tunas? I mean, I, I personally think that it is, but am I wrong? So, so technically, I think it's very possible. We, we have the data to inform assessment models. Therefore, we have the data to inform um, conditioned operating models. I don't see a problem there. Um, the issue, 
technically i think we can design management procedures for them we've had a go at toy models i don't think that's too hard either but the other question about whether or not it will be accepted as a framework for providing management advice is a separate issue and i can't really comment on that but on the technical side of things i really don't see a problem great thank you now i'm going to read this question from the chat from um, david i want i don't have someone necessarily to assign it to so i'm happy for anyone to jump in and answer it it is fairly technical are there examples of operational management objectives that are not stock centric for example that are focused on stock complexes or focused on fleet level objectives that could be the basis of developing a marine uh, management procedure Tom, you might want to take a crack at that one, but certainly anyone else could as well. So it's not well, a single stock objective, but multi-stock or fleet objectives. For the most part, people operate on the performance outcomes from the operating model, and those things are known in a multi-stock model. Um, but I think Redfish in Eastern Canada, when they did their MSE, they also tried to optimize for overall catch of both species combined, the deep water and the Acadian regfish combined, I believe. But for the most part, people focus on um, the, the, the catch that's obtained by management region. I don't think they break that down by stock. So for example, bluefin doesn't distinguish between the two stocks when it, when it says tack in the east area and tack in the west area. Those catches are not broken down by stock. They're assigned by area. So for example, the western... Uh, Atlantic contains catch of eastern fish. So that would be one example where people don't talk about yield objectives by stock. They deal with them by area, and then they deal with their biomass conservation um, performance by stock. Um, that would be, those are the only things I could really think of. Great. Thank you. I do have a question for Sanan, but um, I see Rob's hand up and I'm, I think it might be to this very point. So um, if the moderators could unmute Rob and we'll, we'll get to his question. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to, just to raise a, a fairly quick point on, on this issue of, of management objectives from a WCPFC perspective. Um, WCPFC went, went through a fairly um, uh, sort of intensive process of, of looking at management objectives through management objective workshops that ran for uh, a few years. I think there were three three years of management objectives workshops followed by a hover strategy workshop uh, to really identify those uh, those management objectives that would uh, that would feed into the hover strategy process. Um, that process developed quite a large number of um, management objectives, and it was quite interesting that they they really focused on the social and economic side of things, uh, with a smaller number of objectives around stock specific things, and a smaller, uh, even smaller number around ecosystem obje ob ob uh, uh, objectives. When we ran the MSC analyses, what we we really struggled to represent those social and economic management objectives from the outputs, uh, and we kind of. Um, to to representing them as uh, as proxies based on catch levels or biomass levels, um, and perhaps for that reason they kind of receive less attention uh, in the, in the discussions following. And when it came to adopting the uh, the, the skipjack management procedure, uh, the discussion really condensed very much around achieving the TRP uh, and achieving stability in the fishery, and those were the two sort of primary objectives that were considered at, at that point. Um, but the, the other objectives remain on the table um, and through the ongoing monitoring process, um, through the, uh, the script check process, um, we're looking at trying to, uh, to monitor those, those additional uh, objectives and, uh, and provide them information sort of post hoc uh, after the event and uh, yeah. to, to see if the, uh, the, uh, the harvest strategy is really delivering in those, uh, in those areas. Great. So that's just a, a quick perspective from the, the WCPFC side of things. Yeah, thank you, Rob. We appreciate that. Um, Sinon, I, you know, said at the beginning that I thought management of tropical tunas is one of the most difficult things that the RFMOs have to do, and allocation is a big reason. Uh, and those who know me know that I say that all the time, all around the world, that this is a difficult problem. 
Um, and then I saw your IOTC timeline and it made me um, sick to my stomach. Uh, so, you know, how do we get past some of those allocation problems that are taking a lot of the air out of the room? And, and how do we develop that mechanism at the same time that we're developing the, the harvest strategy? In my mind, the harvest strategy sort of sets the total opportunities the allocation mechanism divides those opportunities. How, how do we do those at the same time and, and get to an end of that timeline? Uh, yeah, that's that's an, a question that I don't really have an answer to uh, because uh, it's an evolving um, process. Because, uh, for example, in some RFMOs where the numbers are for, for negotiating, um, uh, if um, the numbers are small, it's easier to negotiate and agree to. And and, and also it all depends on uh, the types of fleets involved, whether it's all industrial or whether it's artisanal or a, a mix of those. What IOTC is attempting to do uh, is to develop a formula-based allocation system. Once agreed to, then it remains stable for at least for a, a, a longer period of time rather than a continuous negotiation, for example, what, what's been done in CCSPT or in, in ICAT, where there is a continuous negotiation with, with every after every three years after a new stock assessment or a new run on, on the management procedure itself. So uh, what, uh, um, what the IOTC is doing uh, might be an example to follow up in, in the next few years uh, once it, it, it's been agreed to. Um, we also have to recognize that even though the CCSPT has adopted an allocation system, uh, allocation key, it has taken so many years for them to even agree to that allocation key itself on the, on the first instance. So hopefully uh, the IOTC model might be an example to follow up in, in, the, next, uh, in, in the next few years uh, to have a mathematical formula just like a half strategy itself. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, it does seem worth the investment, even if the investment is a, is a long one. So thank thank you for that, um, Ludwig. Um, we heard from Adrian a little bit of information about the MSC timeline and uh, requirements, and I'm wondering, in your experiences, did the did the MSC certification or or any of the changes over the years impact the um, the decision making of the islands of your members, or, um, or yeah, what what is the relationship with the FFA members and the MSC when it comes to um, adoption of the the skipjack harvest strategy? As I said, I think one of the acceptance of um, the uh, harvest strategy approach is seeing the positive outcome of. Um, strategy approach in terms of market access. So although first and foremost they, they, they see that their, their their interests are protected through this process, and the next thing they see is how am I going to add value again to what I already have? And they certainly see value in having MSC connected to the process management process that we adopted. In this case with MSC, they, they see a lot of positives in it. They, they know that if, if we don't go this way, there's a possibility that the certification schemes that we currently have can be uh, can be canceled. So they, it's in, in, in it's in the island states interest that they 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 promote our strategies approach. Great. Thank you very much. And um, we do have about seven minutes till the hour. Uh, if there's another participant that maybe has a question for the chat or uh, would like to put your hand up and, uh, and join us live for a moment, that would be fine. But otherwise it's always okay to end a few minutes early and let some folks go to sleep or others get that second cup of coffee. Um, I, and I do now see David uh, DA's hand up, and I think it would definitely be worthwhile to hear from him. So uh, moderators, if you can un unmute David and uh, yeah, take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks for, for this really interesting um, webinar. Uh, I was just going to ask that given that adopting a harvest strategy 
and a management procedure really removes the power of negotiation from from uh, countries that are member of an RFMO. Doesn't that mean that in, it will automatically uh, transform the negotiation and the fights into exclusively allocation fights? So that it seems to me that if the allocations are not sorted out before a harvest strategy, then it will be even harder to come up with an allocation formula after harvest strategy has been uh, adopted. That's a tough one. Um, absolutely. And so if, if any of our uh, panelists would like to take a crack at that, uh, I, I welcome an answer. It, it is a tough one. Um, as you mentioned, it'd be a tough situation. I mean, I, um, I generally characterize a harvest strategy as not taking away all of the management sort of power from the individuals and that setting up the harvest strategy or the management procedure is um, maybe one of the most impactful things that a manager can do. Uh, but certainly the, that allocation problem um, could, could continue uh, well beyond the adoption of a harvest strategy. And that's what we've seen in the Indian Ocean with, with Skipjack and the inability to maintain catch below what the, what the management procedure suggests. Um, Tom, I see you came off of mute. Yeah, I think I think the way you could do it, though, one of the one of the motivations behind changing allocation is to provide you with better opportunities for yield for the same level of conservation performance, perhaps. So, in a multi-species MSE, you might be able to exploit the individual species with greater dexterity, and that might actually get you better performance. Um, with that dynamic allocation. So I think that's how you justify it. You'd have to show those people involved that moving to dynamic allocation or an alternative allocation would nonetheless benefit them. Um, I think that's the only way you could really justify it. Um, yeah. If I may contribute to this discussion. Please. In the Western Pacific, I think as Rob said, their objective is mainly on on socioeconomic, what are the benefits? So when it comes to allocation, first and foremost, as part of this whole process, it's about, it's not about individual allocation, it's about what do I secure within my EEZ or as a group of EEZs versus the high seas. So once that is secured, the members feel safe. They know that within this uh within this EEZ, a group of EEZs, they have time to to do allocation within 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 themselves, but first and foremost is to secure a uh, uh, total uh, an allocation that's within this combined EZ versus the high seas. So the only thing they have to worry about is what percentage goes to the high seas, and that's the one they will really focus on. As within, they know that, and if they can they can come up with criteria how to allocate whatever is it effort or whatever it is within this. Combined EZ. So, first and foremost, secure their rights as a combined EZ, and that which is the high six. As part of this whole process, that, that, that is in the Pacific, that is the way we look at it. Secure our rights as a group first, then we have time to uh, divide it. Yeah, it's it very go, good. Very it good will context. Go as part of the whole, it will go as part of the whole package of you know, accepting the whole uh, harm strategy approach. Yes, yeah, so that's very helpful context. Thank you. Um, Miguel, can I offer you just one minute on this and then I'll wrap us up? Yeah, yeah, very fast. I, I was going to say that I, I tend to agree with, with David and I think there is um, with Tom as well, but the question to me is when you, if, if um, you, um, for the industry, if you tell the industry that if uh, you fish to this level, uh, your fishery will become more profitable in a situation where there is overcapacity or overcatch, uh, the meaning of that is that someone has to go in most cases. And uh, and that's the main problem to me. So it's much more difficult to agree on an allocation when you are aware that initially uh, not every not all the players may remain in the ocean. And and that's what is probably going to complicate quite a lot of discussions in, in the different uh, RFMOs because in, in, in many of those there is already overcapacity. I think uh, 
to me, that's, a, that's the main problem here. Yeah, that is a very good point. And of course, there are additional considerations you could think of, like um, having ecosystem-based reference points that would require you to leave even more fish um, in the in the water and therefore ask more boats to, to stop fishing. So there certainly are issues that still need to be worked out. But from um, my perspective, harvest strategies are a, a step in the right direction for um, figuring out the sort of total opportunities. And then we uh, still have some issues to solve with how to divide those opportunities. But um, with that, I'll, I'll just like to wrap, wrap us up with just a couple of minutes, please. And um, thank the panelists, of course, for volunteering their time at late, late hours and early hours to uh, join us today. The hosts um, from the harveststrategies.org for, for inviting me and for making this happen. And of course, our interpreters for the good work that they've done today and do every day. Um, all of you attendees, I'll say um, essentially nobody left um, and no one still has left. So it's really uh, a testament to how engaging our, our panelists have been today. And that's wonderful. Uh, I also just want to acknowledge the project um, advisory committee of this, um, this Jeff funded Common Oceans project at FAO, which has provided some funding for this webinar series and some other um, items. And Finally, I want to mention to everyone that the next webinar will be in January and we'll focus on harvest strategies beyond the HCR. So that's all the other pieces of the harvest strategy beyond the harvest control rule that are required to make it a strong, robust uh, management item. Um, so one more time, thank you all. Thanks for inviting me to participate and see you all in January. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.